Praise the Lord, everybody. Good to see you in God's house today. Amen and amen. I said to the first service, I said, do you know why we really ought to trust God? Not just because when we call, he answers. That's wonderful. Matter of fact, he tells us, call on to me, and I will answer you. And so we fully expect that when we pray, especially when we pray according to his will, we know he will answer us. Amen. But the reason why we trust him is not because he answers. We trust him because of the cross of Christ. The scripture says, if he gave him to us, how shall he not freely with him give us all other things? We can trust God because of the cross. We can trust God because he was willing to do that for us. And if he was willing to do that for us, there's nothing that God does not want to do for us. Amen. Thank God he's a good God, worthy of our trust. We give him all the praise. It's good to see you all. Welcome to church, everybody. We are glad that you are in God's house today. Welcome to all of our locations, our online television and social media audience. We are glad that everybody is here to hear a word from God. If you have your Bible, would you take it out? And if you need a Bible, if you will raise your hands, the ushers will be glad to give you one. Let's all hold it up and make this declaration of our faith all together. Ready, go. This is my Bible. It is my primary source of spiritual nourishment. I will read it every day and become all that God wants me to be. My mind will be renewed. My life will be transformed. I will become fully surrendered to Christ. Therefore, I will hide his word in my heart so I can be all that Christ has destined me to be. Amen and amen. Would you remain standing in, or, in honor of God's word? We are going to Genesis chapter number 32, beginning in verse 22. And if you can't find Genesis, you need some spiritual help. Discipleship classes meet on Sunday morning at 9 o'clock, right before services. Wednesday night Bible study is at 7 o'clock. You need it all if you can't find Genesis. Genesis chapter number 32, beginning in verse 22. The Bible says, and he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. Today in our series, Come Back Stories, I want to minister to you on what I believe every person needs at least one time, but more than one time in their life in order to receive and walk in and be everything that God's called you to be. And that is just one touch from God. How many of you know just one foot touch from God changes everything? So often in life, we're in a position where we're trying to, by willpower, get over things or overcome stuff, and we have to realize that sometimes we can't do it on our own. What we need is that touch from the Almighty. Amen? Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you for your word. Thank you for your anointing. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Teach every heart in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, Amen. you may be seated. We used to sing a song in old church. An old church is like church that most people don't know about anymore. Old church was different than churches today. Old church, you have a prayer meeting, the whole church would show up. New church, you have a prayer meeting, three show up. Doesn't matter how big the church is either. It's not like, you know, more show up, you got a bigger church. It's just, and we'd stay all night. People would stay through the night. 
Old church, we used to have meetings day after day after day. They were packed all the time. Now you ask people to come to two services in one day, ain't nobody coming. They're, you're lucky if you can get them to come to one service in one day. I'm not bragging about new church. I'm just telling you the, the reality of it. Anyway, we used to sing a song in old church. It, was, it went like this. Shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me, and I am no longer the same. He touched me, oh, he touched me, and oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened, and now I know he touched me and made me whole. There's something about the touch of God. The touch of God will free you. The tough touch of God will heal you. It will deliver you. It will break you. It will bless you. It will help you. It will restore you. It will redeem you. It will transform you. There is something about the touch of God that can do for you what nothing else can do in your life. If you came here today and you were depressed and down, you need a touch from God. If you came here today and you were sick and diseased, you need a touch from God. If you came here today full of anxiety and worry, you need a touch from God. If you came here today and you were broke and barely making it by, you need a touch from God. If you came here today and you had no passion and no fire and no desire from God, you need a touch from God. There's nothing like the touch of God. There is no replacement. There is no substitute. When God touches your life, it makes a difference. And as we come to our story, we find Jacob is in need of a touch from God. Jacob was one of two twins born to Isaac and Rebekah. And when Rebekah gave birth, Jacob came out holding the heel of his brother Esau. It's almost as if he knew that whoever came out first would get the blessing of the firstborn. And in Bible times, the blessing of the firstborn was extremely, extremely powerful and important. It was basically double blessing. It was two times. And, and many people believe that that means you just you know have more blessing, and that's wonderful, and that's great. But you were given twice as much because you had greater responsibility. It was your job whenever you got the blessing of the firstborn born to make sure that if the others went astray that you took your blessing and you leveraged it so that they would come back so that they would be okay and that's why in the story of the prodigal son the story of the second son of the elder son is so sad because the elder son did not use his double blessing in order to go get the younger son and that's why also in the bible jesus is called the firstborn because jesus used everything that he he is to redeem you and I when we went astray. And so when we come to the text, we find that it seems as though from birth, Jacob had this wrestling spirit within him. And so his parents called him Jacob, which means supplanter. It means deceiver. It means Connive, and I don't know why in Bible times parents would name their children such bad things. By the way, before you name your child, look up the name. Find out, find out what it means. Why do you want to call your child something like that for the rest of their life? And in Bible times, your life would follow your name. Your name was like a destiny. It was like a pronouncement over your life. And if you look at the life of Jacob, his entire life was spent struggling. His entire life was spent wrestling. He begins by wrestling for his father's affection. When we read through the story of Jacob and Esau, we find out that Jacob's father, Isaac, loved his brother Esau more than he loved Jacob. And the reason probably was Esau was a man's man. Esau was a hunter. He liked to kill stuff. He liked to, you know, go out in the woods and get him some deer. And he liked to fish and probably liked sports. And the Bible says he was hairy. But not just like regular kind of hairy. Like he was hairy, hairy. This guy had like his back looked like a gorilla in every single way. I mean, he had hair all over his back. He needed some serious manscaping. I mean, he had hair coming up out of his T-shirt. He had hair coming out of his ears. He had hair coming out of his, his nose. He had eyebrows that needed to be trimmed on a regular basis. I remember when I was about 14, I was in the barber chair, and this older guy came and sat down next to me. And the older guy said to the barber, said, can you trim the eyebrows a little bit? I said, what in the world? Why you got to trim your eyebrows like that? Anyway, some people are hairy like that. If you are a hairy man, this is your patron saint. Esau is your patron saint. 
Esau, he probably loved Duck Dynasty, you know, the, the big long beards and stuff like that. Anyway, because he was a man's man, his father, Isaac, loved him more than he loved Jacob. And Jacob, he was a mama's boy. The Bible actually says he loved to stay around the tent. That's code for mama's boy. I like to stay around the house. You know, as a matter of fact, he liked to cook. You know, if, if, you, if you're a guy and, you know, you little like that and you like to cook and stay, you're a mama's boy. And his mama used to, you know, probably get, get his clothes out for him and, you know, the night before, lay him out on the bed. He put him on, perfectly quaff his hair. And his mother loved him more than she loved Esau. And because of all of this, you know, misplaced direction of love and all, we find that Jacob struggled for his father's affection ever since he was young. And by the way, most of the problems that can happen or that we grow up into can stem from the love that we either received or didn't receive as we get older. There's a lot that goes on that stems from what happens right there in the home, which is supposed to be the breeding ground for what we become in life. And anyway, he struggled. And then, of course, the epic struggle with his brother. There's a day where uh, Esau was out in the field and he was hunting. And Rebecca, the mom, she was a conniver also. Matter of fact, we're going to see that she, she had a brother who was also a conniver. Some things run in families, by the way. Some things get passed down from one person to the next. And thank God for the blood of his cross, which broke not only the power of sin, but the power of generational curses over our lives. Just because your mother was like that and your grandmother was like that or your father was like that and your, your grandfather was like that doesn't mean you have to be like that. And the reason is because of the cross of Christ. Amen? And so the mother was a little bit of a conniver as well. And so because she loved Esau uh, more than, or Jacob more than she loved Esau, she said to Jacob, she said, well, your brother is out. Let's trick your dad. I mean, the mom and the son just coming together against the dad. It sounds like some people's house, doesn't it? Anyway, coming against it. And she said, well, your brother is out. Your dad's getting old. You know, his eyes are growing dim. He's ready to die. He's got to pronounce the blessing of the firstborn. Why don't you dress up in animal skins and pretend to be Esau? You know you're hairy. If, you, if, you, if somebody else can put on animal skins and they, they impersonate you. And he's got on animal skins. And, and, and Isaac, he can't see very well. And so he comes comes before his father and he pretends to be his brother Esau and so Isaac says is this my son Esau and he says yes and Isaac feels and he feels and he feels the fur and he feels the animal skin he says yep that's my boy right there come on somebody that's nasty I don't I just can't anyway it's in the Bible it's a story in the Bible anyway and when he thinks it's when he thinks it's es when he thinks it's Esau, he pronounces the birthright blessing on him. And just as he pronounces the birthright blessing, blessing, in comes Esau from the field, and he sees what his brother has done. That he has stolen the birthright from him, and he vows to kill him. And so there's this epic struggle that pursues or or begins at that moment between Esau and Jacob. And then of course, because his brother wants to kill him, Jacob can't stay around there. And so Jacob has to flee, has to go to another place, and he goes to another place. And when he goes to another place, he has an epic struggle with his father-in-law, Laban. Laban was the brother of Rebekah. Laban was a trickster also. Laban, Rebekah, and Jacob. Tricksters, all of them. It runs in the family. And so he wants to marry one of Laban's daughters. And so he likes, he had two daughters, one by the name of Rachel, one by the name of Leah. And Rachel was really, really beautiful, the Bible says. And so he naturally wanted to marry her. And Leah, let's just say she had a nice personality. You know what I mean? And and so he really didn't want to marry her. And so he wanted to marry Rachel. But the father looked and said, well, this one here is going to have a problem getting married. So the father tricked him into marrying Leah. And then he had to work like seven more years in order to get the hand of Rachel as well. And so now he has this tension with his father-in-law. And now he's got sister wives in the house. And so he's got struggling going on in the house. Any man that wants more than one wife is crazy. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just about to tell you something. In any case, he struggles. And then as time goes on, he begins to grow prosperous. And he grows prosperous over the things that Laban has. And he grows prosperous and he gets land and he gets cattle and he gets servants and he's starting to prosper. And the brother-in-laws begin to hate him because they think he's prospering over what belongs to them. And so now they want to kill him as well. And so now he struggles also with his brother-in-laws. And it looks like from his life, 
even though he's struggling, that his way of attaining things has paid off. He has stolen and he's gotten the birthright. He has connived and he's gotten the wife that he wanted. He has connived and he's gotten cattle and he's gotten land and he's gotten houses and he's gotten all these things. And so it looks like with the cutting of the corners that he has, he has received blessing. But how many of you know the way that you get it matters? See, there are too many people that are more concerned with just getting it, and they will get it no matter how they have to get it. They will lie. They will steal. They will cheat. They will excuse themselves from certain biblical behaviors because if it's the Bible or the blessing, there's a lot of times that people will choose the blessing over the Bible. But I want to tell you that when you try to get it that way, it eats on the inside of you. It separates you from your relationship with God. And the scripture says that there is a blessing. It's called the blessing of the Lord, and it makes one rich and adds no sorrow. And you may have to wait a little bit in order to get it God's way, but getting it God's way is always the better way, I promise you. And so it seems like it's paid off, but it really hasn't. And now he is in a situation where he's got conflict all around him. If he stays where he is, they're going to kill him. But if he goes back home, they're going to kill him. And so he is wrestling. Conflict is all around him. He doesn't know what to do. And so he comes up with this plan. And this plan is, I'll go back and reconcile with Esau. And what I'll do is I'll send ahead all of these blessings. How many of you know that sometimes we think we can buy blessings? How many of you know you can't buy blessings? How many of you know blessing comes by the condition of your heart, right? If your heart is right, everything else flows out of your life. The Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of the heart, all the issues of life. You can't buy a blessing. It's a matter of where your heart is. God looks on the heart. God's not concerned with all the outside stuff. If you get the inside stuff right, the obedience will manifest itself on the outside. And then when you're willing and obedient, in other words, when it's on the outside, as a result of what's on the inside, then you'll eat the good of the land. And so he's got a plan. His plan is I'll send some blessings ahead of me. And when, I, when Esau sees all these things, he'll forgive me. But as he sends his servants on with the blessings, they come back to him. They say, Esau's coming. He's got an army of 400 men with him. And all of a sudden, the Bible says that Jacob is terrified by the news. How many of you know there are some problems you cannot fix with your plan? How many of you know there's some things that you will encounter in life where you will concoct a plan in order to fix it and you will think that it is the right plan? But can I tell you, God will frustrate your plans if your plans do not include God. God wants to frustrate your plans so much that it eventually pushes you to the place where you have no options, where God pulls all the options off of the table. And when God pulls all the options off of the table, then you are forced to include God in his plan. And God is so good that God will even use the stuff that you create and the conflict that you create in your life to cause you to come to him. And so now he's got conflict all around. He can't go home and he he can't stay where he is and everything is falling apart. And here's what I love about the story. And into this scene, God enters the conflict. Isn't it amazing when we've created our situation, when we have created our chaos, when everything that is around us that is falling apart is falling apart because of what we did and we knew we were doing it at the same time that we were doing it, that God, despite all that, chooses to enter our conflict. God could stay out of it because we would deserve what we have coming to us, but God doesn't choose to leave us in the middle of our chaos, but rather he enters the chaos that we create. And as we see God enter the conflict, it is a type and a shadow of the story of redemption. Because man thought that man could fix himself. Man came up with plans, well, I'll just behave myself, and I'll just obey this, and I'll just be more good than I am evil, and I'll I'll just work in my own righteousness to get right with God. But the scripture says our self-righteousness is as filthy rags, and so into our conflict, Jesus came. He put on our flesh. He put on our blood. He walked in our shoes. He went to our cross. Why? He was entering the conflict to rescue us from our man-made plans. And so this is what he does for Jacob. Jacob has nowhere to turn. He's stuck between a rock and a hard spot. He's got a conflict with his father-in-law and brother-in-laws because they feel like he's taking what belongs to them. 
and he surveys the situations, and he says, I got to get out of here. Problem is, he's got nowhere to go. He can't go back home because Esau wants to kill him. He's stuck between a rock and a hard spot. Have you ever noticed that when you're stuck between a rock and a hard spot, God shows up? When you're stuck between a situation that is bad and another situation that is bad. When you have no options, God shows up. What a mighty God we serve. That he even uses the chaos of our own causing and the plan of the enemy in our life to enter our life. And then the Bible says that after Jacob sends one part of the family this way and the other part of the family that way, it says that he's alone all by himself. Have you ever been all by yourself because of conflict and chaos? There's a lot of things that show up when you're all by yourself. A lot of things that show up in your loneliness, crazy thoughts, vain imaginations, paralyzing fear, all in the solitude of yourself. A lot of things show up when you're lonely, but can I tell you something else that always shows up when you're lonely? It's the God of our loneliness. Matter of fact, if you're lonely, if you're abandoned, if you're by yourself, expect a visit. I promise you that God is going to show up in the middle of your loneliness. And there, Jacob wrestles with God to the breaking of the day. He's wrestling It's amazing how when we have all this conflict around us and God shows up, how we will still wrestle God. How we won't just give in. How we won't just say, I'm done. I want to talk to the people who have wrestled to the bitter end. Stuff has been closing in on you in your life. It's been spinning out of control and God's been dealing with you about different things in your life, but you're still wrestling. Has anything ever got you so good that you hold on to it to the bitter end? You're going to fix it yourself. You're going to make it make it happen yourself. God, I know I got to do this and God, I know I got to do that and God, I know I need to be obedient here, but God, I just need to do a little bit more here. I think I got this, God. And we wrestle and wrestle and wrestle with God. And says he wrestled with that man to the breaking of the day. Time was running out. It's amazing how in the face of what we know is seemingly circumstances that we cannot come back from, time running out, that we will continue to wrestle with God instead of trusting him. And so this wrestling match ensues, and and it says that the the Lord sees that he is not going to prevail. In other words, Jacob is going to continue to wrestle with him. And so because he's going to continue to wrestle, and because time is running out, the Bible says that as he wrestled with him, suddenly God touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. When God sees that time is running out, when God sees that he can't fool with the problem anymore, when God has given us a space, can I tell you what God will often do? God will often touch us in that circumstance. And when God touches you, how many of you know just one touch from God can break off of you what's been holding you back for the rest of your life? And God touches him. And when God touches him, some things happen. When God touches us, some things happen. Number one, when God touches us, it gives us a new attitude. Gives us a new attitude. How many of you know, some of us, we need an attitude adjustment. Attitude is something that is internal that shows up externally. Attitude is something that can be felt Attitude is something that, and some of us, we have an attitude even with God. An attitude of self-righteousness, an attitude of pride, an attitude of, you know what, God, you exist for my pleasure. Some of us need an attitude adjustment. Some of us has an attitude that says, you know what, God, the only reason why I'm really serving you is because of what you can do for me. God, I really believe that you exist for my pleasure instead of me existing for your pleasure. And we need an attitude adjustment. And notice what the scripture says. And he said, let me go for the day breaks, God speaking. But then Jacob responds and says, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now this seems like Jacob is going to continue to wrestle. But we have to understand the difference between wrestling and resigning. 
You see, what has happened his entire life is Jacob has sought the blessing no matter what he had to do to get it. His entire life, Jacob's attitude was, well, if this is what you want from me, I'm not going to wait on it. I'm going to take it. I'm going to cut this corner. I'm going to connive. I'm going to supplant. I'm going to do all this kind of stuff. And don't look at Jacob in that tone of voice like we don't do the same kind of stuff. Because every time we excuse ourselves from a biblical act of obedience, we are in essence saying to God, the blessing is more important than you, the blesser. Every time we acquire and we do not put God first, see how quiet it got right there? Every time we think that God is not our source, every time we say, God, that doesn't apply to me, and God, I don't need to put you first, whether it's in our finances or in our family or whatever it is, that we're saying to God is, the thing I want is more important than you. And Jacob has now come to a place where, notice what he says, after God touches him, he says, unless you bless me, I'm not leaving. In other words, God, I am tired of trying to get all this stuff my way. I've got it the way that I I wanted to get it, and I've cut corners, and it's come back to bite me, and I'm through with that. God, unless you want me to have it, I'm not going to take it. God, if it means that I have to wait, so be it. God, if it means I have to put you first, so be it. God, if it means that I have to put me second, so be it. God, unless you want to bless me, I don't want it anymore. See, some of us have to resign to the fact that God's way may take longer. Matter of fact, did you hear what the scripture said when it said that God led the children of Israel out of the wilderness into the promised land? It said he led them the long way. (laughs) I said, God, why are you leaving the long way? They got, they've been 400 years already over here. Isn't it time for them to leave? Why are you leading them the long way? God, they got people following them. Why are you leading them the long way? Because the long way, the short way was through open space. The short way was the Egyptians were going to capture them. The Egyptians were going to overtake them. The short way was they were going to be back in Egypt before they knew it. But the long way meant that God could protect them. The long way meant that God knew the path that he had paved for them. The long way meant that the Egyptians that were following them would be drowned in the Red Sea. See, God knows what's up ahead of you. You may want the short way, but God wants the permanent way. God wants to give you something, and he wants it to last in your life. So God didn't take them the short way. And Jacob is now at a place in his life where he's saying, I don't want it the short way. I want it the God way. He's having an attitude adjustment in his life. But his attitude goes deeper than just God. I only want the blessings that you have. And I I refuse to get it any other way. He now has a repentant attitude. He's wrestling with God. God touches his hips and says, what's your name? He said, my name is Jacob. How many of you know when God asks you a question, he's not looking for an answer? How many of you know when God asks you a question, God is trying to alert you to something? God is not trying to inform himself. God is, um, God is omniscient. He knows everything. He knows your name even before he asks you what your name is. What is he trying to do? He's trying to get Jacob to look in the mirror. Who are you? I am Jacob. That's who I am. After all these years, I'm a conniver. I'm a supplanter. I, Jacob. I don't, I don't want to be Jacob. That's not who I want to be. But that's who I am. Is God trying to shame him? Is God trying to condemn him? No, God is trying to release him. See, here's what happens when we repent. Here's what happens when we come to the place of acknowledgement in the wrong that we've done. God is able to break that thing off of us. And when God breaks that thing off of us, then God is free to let his blessings flow in our lives. So God is bringing him to an attitude of repentance. And this is part of the problem with the modern day church. We don't think repentance is necessary for salvation. We think all it takes 
is I need to put my faith in Jesus Christ. If you really put your faith in Jesus Christ, you know what you will do? You will repent. What does that mean? It means you will have an attitude adjustment concerning things that are ungodly. You will no longer see the ungodly things as okay and the ungodly things as right. And you will do everything with the help of the Holy Spirit to turn in the opposite direction. That's why the Bible says any man who is in Christ is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. That's why the Bible says you must be born again. In other words, you're not who you used to be. You're a brand new person that this world has never experienced before. And Jacob, I know you are born this way, but it's time for you to be born again so you're not that way anymore. There's repentance. I'm reminded in the Bible of the story about a man by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a wicked tax collector. He extorted money from people. And Jesus is walking down the street. There are crowds thronging him, massive amounts of people. Sometimes we think Jesus only had five around him when he was preaching. And t- Jesus, Jesus had crowds. I mean, Jesus was the, the, the first you know, person who filled arenas. That was Jesus. When Jesus preached, people crowded him to the point where he couldn't even walk. And he's walking down the street, and he looks up in a tree. And here's this man by the name of Zacchaeus. He is a tax collector. He is wicked, but he had a curiosity about Jesus. Can I tell you, even the wicked have a curiosity about Jesus. Even the wicked want to know, who is this Jesus that I always, I mean, God will make you curious so that he can pull you to him. And he looks up in the tree and he says, Zacchaeus, I'm coming to your house today. And everybody else looks at Jesus. I can't believe he's going to go hang out with that kind of person. Can I tell you, if you're a believer, get your stuff straight, get, get your life strong, and then you know what? Mingle a little bit. You know what I mean by mingle a little bit? I mean, get around some people who need Jesus. Notice what I said, get your stuff straight, though, first. Because some of y'all, you know, you just get saved, you know, and you're smoking weed your whole life and drinking your whole life, and all of a sudden you go right back to hanging around the people who are smoking weed and who is drinking again. And before you know it, two days after you've been saved, you're smoking weed again, and you're drinking again, and you're sexing again, and you're clubbing again. But you saved, and you love Jesus. You need to repent. And so he looks up, says, I'm I'm coming to your house. And he goes to his house, and he has what I call the first power lunch ever. So much power is released in that moment that Zacchaeus looks at him. He says, listen, if I've taken anything from any man wrongfully, I will restore fourfold. The law said you only had to restore it twofold. But how many of you know when you get saved, you're not trying to do the minimum. You're trying to do as much as you can for Jesus. You're not trying to bear. I love when people are trying to, can I do this and can I do this? Is it okay to do? Why are we having this conversation? Why are we asking if it's possible to get as close to the line of sin as possible and still be saved? Why is that the conversation? Why are we having conversations that say, how much can I do for God? Not how far for can I go and still be saved? We need an attitude adjustment. He said, fourfold, fourfold. And you know what Jesus said? He said, salvation's come to this house today. Why? Because salvation is not just a prayer. Salvation is a fruit. Salvation is evidence that is seen in your life. You're not who you used to be anymore. You're a different kind of person. Every person that Jesus came into contact with that got saved was radically changed. Look in your Bible. The woman at the well. Jesus goes to meet her in the middle of the day. She's drawing water when no one else would be there because she's full of shame because of the sin that's in her life. She's been married five times and she's currently living with a man who's not her husband. I didn't forget what I'm going to say. I'm just letting it sit there for a minute. I'm just letting it linger for just a second. Six men, and nothing has filled her because there's only one thing that can fill you in your life. The scripture said he's put eternity in the hearts of man. In other words, there really is a God-sized hole in every person's heart that only Jesus can fill, and you will be thirsty the rest of your life if you don't put Jesus there. 
So Jesus comes along. He has a conversation with her. And she gets radically changed and radically saved. And she goes back into the town. And she tells everybody, come see a man that told me everything that I've ever did. This could be the Christ. It says they all came out and saw Jesus. The whole city came to Jesus. But it says she left her water pot. See, the water pot was her old life. The water pot was what she was shaking. She was sneaking in and sneaking out. Now she's walking into town saying, hey, y'all, everybody. Hey, y'all, everybody. Come here, come here. I'm not worried about what anybody thinks anymore because I've been set free. I'm not who I used to be. I'm not who I want to be, but I'm changed. We need to have a repentant heart. All throughout the Bible, there was a woman. She had an alabaster box. She was a prostitute. Jesus transformed her. Jesus changed her. Her name was Mary. She was the sister of Martha. She was the brother of Lazarus. If you read your Bible, you find out that after Jesus changed her life, he had a very close relationship with the family. Because how many of you know after Jesus does something for you, you ought to be close to him? Most of us doing hit and runs on Jesus. You know what a hit and run on Jesus is? We're getting just enough of Jesus for him to fix our situation. As soon as he fixes our situation, we back out to whatever we're doing again. Hit and run on Jesus. When they got, when Jesus did something for them, they got close. Jesus would stop over their house. Jesus would have lunch. But before all that relationship, she was touched by Jesus. And she was as Jesus was invited to the house of a Pharisee by the name of Simon. And Jesus was in the house. And he came as the honored guest, but they didn't treat him like the honored guest. They didn't give him no water for his feet, no oil for his head, no kiss on his face. And she saw as they were disrespecting the Lord of glory. They brought him there to trap him. They brought him there to, to prove that he wasn't who he said he was. And as she's watching all of this unfold, because in Bible times, they would gather in porticos outside the house, and people who weren't has-beens or, or weren't the upper crust of society, they would just watch from the outside. And she's seen as all this is going on, and she has enough. And the Bible says she breaks in, she bum-rushes the barbecue. She goes right to the feet of Jesus. And the Bible says she breaks her alabaster box. Somebody said, isn't that special? Somebody said, well, that was so special because that was so expensive. And yes, it was. And yes, that's one of the reasons why. But you know why it was most special? Because that was how she made her living. She was a prostitute. If you read the book of Proverbs, you find out it was part of the enticement that went on to lure men into a trap. But she met Jesus. How many of you know when you meet Jesus, you break what you used to be? When you meet Jesus, you become different. You are repentant. And when God meets Jacob, when Jacob meets God, is a better way of saying it. You ain't meeting God. You meeting God, God's not meeting you. God knows who you are, even when you're stuck in your sin and shame. Jacob had an attitude adjustment. Second thing that Jacob had, I better go quick. Second thing that Jacob had is he got a new identity. He said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, because you are now a prince with God. In Bible times, the name was so important because what the name did is it spoke your destiny. And God said, now that you come to a place of repentance, I got to put a new name on you because now I got to put a name on you that will drive you towards your destiny. You are now a prince with God. So everything that you will now live up to from this moment forward is changed. You are no longer going to be a supplanter, a conniver, a deceiver. You are having an identity change. Oh my God, people today need an identity change. They are confused about all sorts of things because the world has put labels on them that forced them to a demonic destiny. But God wants to put a label on you and a name on you that will drive you to a divine destiny. He said, you are Israel because you are now a prince with God. Matter of fact, do you know what happens when you get born again? The Bible says God puts his name on you. They were first called Christians at Antioch. Do we realize what it means when we say we are Christians? It's not the religion that we are under. It is not how we identify the church that we go to, although it is culturally. It literally means we are Christ-like ones. That means that everything Jesus is, is our destiny. Matter of fact, if you read the ironic blessing 
in the Old Testament, the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to shine upon you, all that. The last line says, and I will put my name on Israel. And I will put, God has put his name on you. That means that everything Jesus is, is your destiny. And so if he is Jehovah Jireh, your destiny is to walk in provision. If he is Jehovah Rapha, your destiny is to walk in healing. If he is the Lord, your banner, your destiny is to walk in freedom. If he is the Lord, your shepherd, your destiny is to walk in being cared for. If he is Shalom, the Lord, your peace, then your destiny is to have a peace that passes all understanding. Everything Jesus this is, is your destiny. And when God touches you, you change. Your destiny changes. Your ways changes. Everything about you changes. God wants to give you a new identity. There was a story, maybe you saw it recently, about a famous swimmer by the name of Diana Nyad. Have you ever heard of her? her? Diana Nyad, I think her name is. Anyway, she was the first person ever to swim from Cuba all the way to Florida. Now, I don't agree with everything about her lifestyle, but her story is, in, is, is incredibly inspirational. When she was five years old, she was with her mom, and they were standing on the shores of Florida, and, and she said, Mommy, what's over there? She said, over there is Cuba. It's so close you could almost swim to it. Her father at five took her into his office and said, tomorrow you're going to go to school. And if all the other kids were to look up their name in the dictionary, they won't find their name in the dictionary. You'll be the only one. And she, he showed her what her name meant, Nyad. And again, not what I would name my kid. It literally means a, uh, a, a water nymph in Greek mythology. And he said, second definition, it means champion swimmer. And her entire life, she lived. Matter of fact, she became one of the greatest swimmers of all time. And at the age of 60, you know what she said? She said, I'm going to do what nobody's ever done before. Not at age 20. At age 60, she said, I'm going to swim from Cuba all the way to Florida. 110 miles. She has to go through the night in order to do it. She tried four times and failed. She got stung by jellyfish. She got stung by manta rays. She got attacked by sharks, and yet she decided she would never quit. On the fifth time at age 65, she got in the water, and 52 hours later, through the night, she went, and she swam 110 miles, came up on the shore. When she came up out of the waters, her face was so swollen, she couldn't say but a couple of things. She managed to say three things. The first thing that she said is she said, never give up on your dreams. Second thing she said is she said, you're never too old to accomplish your dreams. Third thing she said is she said, it looks like a solitary sport, but it takes a team. All because her father told her what her name meant. And she would be able to look that up in the dictionary. Can I tell you, you don't need to go to the dictionary to find out what your name means. You're a Christian. You get to go to the word of God. You get to go to the book of all books. And you get to find out that everything that is in there is your destiny. Start living your identity. You're a Christian. But then lastly, when God touches you, it gives you new strength. Jacob has wrestled with God. God has touched his hip, and he is now walking with a limp. He's now going toward Esau. Esau is closing in on him. Time is running out. He's got 400 men. Jacob has a limp. Can you imagine the conversation that is going on inside of him as he is approaching this life-altering moment in his life? How many of you know conversations take place on the inside of us whenever we are about to face something that is life-changing? And there's two conversations that take place, the conversation of heaven and the conversation of hell. And I can only imagine what hell was saying to him. This is it. Finally, what comes around goes around. Finally, you're about to get yours. 
Finally, all your sneaking, all your conniving, all your this, all your that, it's about to come to pass in your life. It's about to come to roost in your life. You're about to get it. There's this conversation the enemy is telling him, ha, I'm finally going to get you. You thought I blessed you so you could be happy. I only blessed you so you would stay away from God. There are certain people who have blessings because the enemy gives it to them so they never come to God. And she, this is why. And now he's moving and he's getting closer. But I believe there was another conversation. And I believe on the inside there was a voice saying, don't underestimate my limp. See, he was walking towards Esau. And the enemy was saying, hey, look at him. Look how weak he is. Look at this guy. Finally got him. He can't even walk straight. And I believe there was a voice on the inside of him saying, don't you underestimate my limp. See, there's something about weakness that even makes us stronger. The Bible says in our weakness, he is strong. There's something about the things that we face in life that when we finally give them to the Lord, that prove to be something that God uses in order to bring to pass his destiny in our life. Some of y'all came in here today limping. Some of y'all came in here with lifelong struggles. And God is saying to you that if you'll give it to God, that weakness will become your strength. Because when you have a weakness, you have to learn to get freakishly strong in other areas of your life in order to compensate for the weakness that you have. There was a famous ball player. His name was Jim Abbott. He was a one-arm pitcher. One-arm pitcher in the major leagues. Won the Cy Young. That means best pitcher in baseball with one arm. Hit two home runs in the major leagues with one arm. There are pitchers with two arms that never hit two home runs. In the, he hit two home runs with one arm. Won the Cy Young. I remember when Joey was playing ball when he was a kid. We played a team and the kid had one arm. He was the best kid on the team. He batted number three. He was fast. He pitched. You couldn't believe it. He'd get switch, on, switch gloves. He put, the, he put the glove on his thip. He throw the ball, then he switch it. Just as fast as you ball be really switch it. Kick it up there. One hand. One hand. Boom. Hitting dingers with one hand. See, when you're weak in one area, when you give it to God, you become freakishly strong in other areas. Because you have to. You have to learn. And here's what happens when we give our weakness to God. Same thing that happens to Jacob. He got freakishly strong in prayer. Because now he realized that i got to change this situation. And the only thing that way that I can change it is if I get filled with prayer power. So you come into me and you think I'm weak because I'm limping. But I'm filled with a power that you know nothing of. I'm filled with the power of the Holy Ghost. I'm filled with prayer power because I had to be. Comes limping. He said, he said, I, I've seen God face to face and my life is spared. He became freakishly strong in gratitude. See, when God touches you and makes you right, you suddenly look back on all your wrong and you suddenly say, had it not been for the Lord, I wouldn't have made it this far. Look at all God's brought me through. I've seen God face to face and I lived. Look at the stuff that should have took me out but didn't. Look at the things that I did that should have caused permanent pain but didn't. You become freakishly strong in gratitude. All of a sudden you begin to enter into his courts with thanksgiving into his inner chamber with praise. You realize what God has done. He got before his brother. The Bible says he bowed. He's limping and bowing. Limping and bowing. He bows seven times before his brother. He became freakishly strong in humility. See, people who are weak, but God uses in a strong way, it doesn't make you arrogant. It makes you humble. And don't confuse confidence with arrogance. Because humbleness doesn't mean when somebody gives you a compliment, you're like, oh, yeah, you know, thank you. Just say thank you. Keep it moving. 
But when God uses you when you're weak, can I just be honest with you? And I know I'm, I'm a pretty confident person on the outside, but I can't tell you how many times I cry after I preach. Because I'm like, God, you did that? If they only knew. If they only knew, God. See, when you have a weakness, you become freakishly strong in humility. And Jacob, he's now walking towards his brother Esau, and he's bowing. He's saying, I'm honoring you as the elder. And he said, I know it seems like I'm weak because I'm bowing. It almost seems like I'm begging for mercy, but I'm not. Because you have to understand something, that God gives grace to the humble and resists the proud. So every time I bow, you don't understand that the favor of God is going before me. The favor of God is standing behind me. The favor of God is standing beside me. You don't understand that every time I go low, God goes high. That there is a shield around me. It is a shield, a favor that is around me. You may think I'm susceptible, but I'm freakishly strong in humility and then he becomes freakishly strong in forgiveness he bows seven times how often shall I forgive my my brother seven times the law said three the law said three strikes and you're out that's where we get that from so you do me wrong once I got you I forgive you you do me wrong twice Reluctantly, I forgive you, but now I'm watching you. You do me wrong three times, now I forgive you only because I'm trying to obey God. You do me wrong four times, I write you off. That's what the law said. So Peter comes to Jesus, how, many, how often should I forgive my brethren? Seven times? Like, like he's sticking his chest out going, Jesus, I, I mean, I've been around you. I mean, I've gone from three to seven. Look at the growth that is in my life, Jesus. He's expecting Jesus to give him a pat on the back. Jesus blows up his whole thing. He said, no, 70 times seven. And you get the religious people going, do I really have to give 490 times? He bowed seven times. He became freakishly strong in forgiveness. It's not about what I think you did or what I think you, you did to me or I did to you. It's now about, you know what, just as Christ has forgiven me, I'm here on terms of forgiveness. I may have more for you to forgive than you have for me to forgive, but you know what, I'm here on, I become freakishly strong in something that ordinarily binds people. I'm not going to let bitterness have my life. I'm not going to let all this stuff have my life. I'm going to let, not let the fact that Father loved you more than he loved me have me. I'm walking in forgiveness. I've become freakishly strong and when you finally get touched with God and you look back on your life suddenly you realize you never would have made it without him but now you're stronger now you're wiser now you're better because God has touched your life can we sing can we sing thanks so much for watching if this message encouraged you be sure to join again at one of our many church online experiences live every weekend. Just click watch live in the description below. If you'd also like to learn more about getting involved here at Faith Church, click the connect button. And be sure to subscribe to this channel so that you don't miss a single video. Maybe even share it with one of your friends. Thank you so much for watching. And as always, remember with Jesus, you are destined to win.